So let me then invite, uh, we're heading now to our uh, last talk of the day. Uh, I have the pleasure to invite Professor Zeynep Ton, who will talk about choosing excellence, bad jobs, good jobs, social justice, and injustice. Professor uh, uh, Zeynep Ton, she's a professor of the practice at the MIT Sloan School of Management, uh, and also author of the book, The Good Jobs Strategy. Professor. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. So this is my first in-person presentation in 18 months, so I'm very excited to be here. So, so I will talk about choosing excellence, making bad jobs good, and I'll start with a story. Um, right before the pandemic, the CEO of a Fortune 100 company, it's a financial uh, services company, reached out to me because he was very worried that too many Americans had been left behind with low-paying jobs. He cited the statistic about how 40% of Americans are not able to come up with $400 emergency expense, and he said, this is not good for capitalism. And then at some point during our conversation, he said, but some jobs don't create enough value to justify higher wages. So I asked him if retail would be one of those jobs, working at retail stores, and he said, absolutely. And I said, what if I told you that the, and I'll give you the current statistics, um, the median wage for a retail worker is $13 an hour, but the median wage for a Costco worker is more than $25 an hour. He paused, and of course, when I mention Costco, there's always this thing about, but Costco is different because it's a membership model. So I'm like, okay, and then there's Quick Trip, there's Mercadona, there are other companies in, in different retail segments. And he asked exactly what I was hoping for him to ask me, which was, how do they do it? How are they able to pay their employees double almost the industry average and make a ton of money and offer the lowest prices to their customers? And, and I told them the answer was not that simple. What they did was they redesigned the work in a way that makes their employees worth a lot more than they would at other companies. So they change the work design to increase the productivity and contribution. They simplify the process. They standardize the process. So their employees can be extremely efficient in the way that they do their jobs. They involve their employees in continuous improvement. They empower their employees to make decisions for their customers. And because their employees contribute more, they can pay them more. And in some ways, what they do is, when, if I look at the system that Costco, Mercadona, these other companies I studied create, it's a system of operational excellence. And then uh, the next for him was, he said, this is great. He reached out to his team and he said, how can we make our call center jobs worth $25 an hour? Now, this is, it, it seems so nice and, 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 and hopeful, but this is where kind of things stopped because this company did not do much to improve the jobs. And, and, and here's a puzzle, and this is a puzzle that I have been thinking about for a long time. Because since, you know, you mentioned my book, since my book came out, uh, a lot of CEOs and a lot of executives from large companies have reached out to me because they do want to create good jobs in their organizations. I haven't yet met a leader who would rather pay poverty level wages and offer inhumane conditions to their employees than pay better and offer humane conditions. So, so most leaders would like to offer good jobs. There's a ton of evidence, not just mine, but others, academic evidence, case studies of companies to show that good jobs are good for companies. They help them win with their customers. They, they, they are profit maximizing. We have a paper that shows that you can maximize profits offering much higher wages than, than, than the industry uh, norms. And at the same time, this country and lots of other countries are full of bad jobs, right? Millions of people have bad jobs. So why is this? This is a, this is a puzzle. Why do we have this? And here, based on what I have observed during the last couple of years, here are a couple explanations. The first thing is, I think there's a ton of lack of awareness. Some, sometimes we think that if we 
offer employees a nice culture, nice benefits, have them express themselves freely at work, that could be a substitute for putting food on the table or having stable schedules. So there's unawareness of what a, what a good job is and, 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 and how bad the jobs can be. There's also lack of conviction because creating good jobs and thriving financially and competitively requires a system. It's a system of operational excellence. So you have to invest in people and you have to make smart operational choices. It's not just, I do one thing and, and, and it's going to pay off. And, and frankly, um, implementing this system requires a lot of conviction and a lot of courage. And I've come across you know, some executives who will say, you know, we've raised wages before and it didn't work. We've added more hours of labor. You might have had this in your own organization, right? We've added more hours or we've empowered our employees and lost millions of dollars. These are real stories. They're not making this up. But what is missing here is that one or two things alone don't work because it has to be part of a system. And you have to have conviction in that system. And you have to have courage to be able to implement it. And the courage is important because we live in a world where everything is about this thing or that thing, and what is the ROI on wage increases, what is the ROI on adding staff, what is the ROI on this, and, and we miss the big picture about how do we win with our customers? How do we really live our values? So, so having that big picture requires courage, and so many leaders who have grown up and come up to the high positions in their organizations came up with that ROI type of mindset, and, and that's one of the barriers. And finally, you know, there is the competence and know-how about how to do this right. And obviously, in a 30-minute talk, I won't be able to go through all of these with you, but what I want to do is to give you a sense of how bad the jobs can be in organizations and the consequences for organizations. And at the end of the talk, hopefully offer you conviction that when you create bad jobs and a system around that, that is worse than the good job system. So that's my, that's my objective today. And, and then give you a few organizations that are changing to show you that change is possible. Look, if that company can change, I can do. So, so let's start with the bad jobs. And this is, I'm, I'm providing the statistics before the pandemics. And the pandemics made this so clear to us, right? We, I mean, in, in the United States, 46 and a half million Americans, that's about almost a third of the workforce, before the pandemic, worked in occupations where the median wage was less than $15 an hour. These are the top 10 occupations in the United States. Retail sales workers. We talked about retail omnichannel in, in, in the last session, and, I, and I'll get to that in, in, in a moment. Um, material moving workers, food and beverage service workers. You see how the wages tend to be quite low for these workers. And you might think that $15 an hour is a lot of money, but it really isn't. In, it comes to $31,200 a year if you work 40 hours a week, every single week, and that's below subsistence wage for most families. MIT has a great living wage calculator uh, where you can look at different, um, different areas, metropolitan areas, and look at different family sizes, household sizes, and see what the living wage is. And it's really subsistence wage because it's very minimal. And, and with $15 an hour, even in a place like Cleveland, Ohio, which is very representative of the United States, if you have a two-earner family with one child, you're living below that subsistence wage. And, and to give you a sense of what happens in the organizations, and of course this is assuming that everybody works 40 hours a week, but in many service industries, most workers don't work 40 hours a week every single week. So, so let me show you some data from two different companies um, that, that we have worked with. Apart from my day MIT job, I, I, I have a, a nonprofit called Good Jobs Institute where we help companies thrive creating good jobs. So we gather a lot of data from them and, and, and help, them, help them improve. And usually when we present them their pay data, there's silence in the room because nobody is happy when they see the low pay. So, so this comes from, from a company we're working with right now. It's a restaurant chain. And what I'm showing here is different roles. The busters, host, dishwasher, delivery packer, prep cook. And in the place where these people are working, I'm showing what percentage of them are making subsistence wage. And as you see here, you know, bartenders and servers are doing okay. Bartenders, 100% of them are making subsistence wage. 98% of the servers are. But for the kitchen staff, most of them, and these are only the full-time employees, 
I'm not putting part-timers. These are the full-time workers. Um, they're not making enough money to put food on the table. And you wonder, like, why don't people want to come back to work? And by the way, during the pandemic, we started calling many of these workers essential workers. And then we realized essential workers work in jobs where the pay is like this. Here's data from another company. This is a retail chain that we work with. And what I'm showing is different regions, that, um, different areas where they have stores. And, and again, looking at only full-time employees. And what you see here, the red bars represent the percentage of full-time employees not making subsistence wage. So the situation is quite bad. And when workers have such low wages, they end up living in a vicious cycle of poverty, right? And this vicious cycle of poverty is, is you know, the wages are so low, then they can't make ends meet, they're constantly stressed, and that stress is associated with more obesity, um, lots of heart problems, psychological problems, mental problems, low wages when you don't have enough money, it literally drops your IQ. There are cognitive problems that come with it, and of course these workers are not able to move up in the organization because now they have attendance problems, now they can't focus on the job, and then they have this vicious cycle of poverty. And, and the other thing is that this also has an impact on companies, right? Because the, the slide here that I just passed before, you know, a lot of companies are asking, why can't we hire people? Why don't people want to work here? Why do people quit oftentimes? And the biggest reason across so many companies we work with is because their basic needs are not met, because they are not making enough money, because their schedules are so unstable, because there's no career path for them, and because they don't feel safe. They don't have a safe working environment, or, or, or they don't feel secure in their jobs. So, so, so th this is on the worker side. I want to now turn it over to what happens to companies when they operate this way. And, 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 and this, is, um, this is Jim Sinegal, the co-founder of Costco and my business hero. And, and when my students ask him, you know, why is it that, how, how could you from the beginning pay your employees so much more? His answer was, you know, 70 cents of every dollar we spend to run our company goes to people. He said, all the other costs of running your business, rent, utilities, supplies, and fixtures, everything else only costs 30 cents. So that tells you how important people are, and if you don't do that well, you are going to screw up your company pretty badly. And early on in my research, I studied how badly companies end up screwing up their operations when they offer bad jobs. So my dissertation topic 20 years ago was related to data accuracy <laughs> that you talked about in the last session. I was working with a um, group of retailers. I, 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 I was focused on retail supply chains. And the question we asked was, you know, retailers collect a lot of data. They have point of sales data. They have inventory data. Why can't we apply smart algorithms to these data to help them make more money and to get the right product the right store at the right time? And what we found out was that this is, you know, 20 years ago, retailers had great data but the data were actually quite inaccurate. Oftentimes, their supply chain would get the right product to the right store at the right time, and then in the store, the product will be in the back room and not on the selling floor, it's, or it's on the wrong shelf. Um, I studied this problem with Borders. Anybody remembers Borders? Yeah, they're not with us anymore. Um, not because they did research with me, <laughs> just, just to be clear. But, but, but so what I saw, and, and I saw these big operational problems, and I'm an operations professor. I'm not a people, you know, I'm, I'm not a labor economist. I'm not, um, I, I, I'm not really um, focusing on the HR side. So I saw these operational problems, and they had a huge impact on sales, on profitability, um, on supply chain decisions in the future. If you're making your decisions based on information, information that's not accurate, then you end up making bad decisions in the future. And when I looked at why do these problems happen all the time, a huge source was people related. Um, stores that have more employee turnover had more problems. Stores that were understaffed had more problems. Stores that had less training had more problems. And in fact, companies were operating in this vicious cycle. And this vicious cycle starts with the mentality that people are a cost to be minimized. And 
you create systems to minimize that cost, you invest less in labor, then you have high employee turnover, you have understaffed stores, you have low ability because people can't focus on the job. That leads to operational problems. Operational problems reduce sales and profits. When your sales are lower, what happens to your labor budgets? They shrink and this vicious cycle continues. So this vicious cycle is, is expensive, but even the turnover itself is expensive. Right? Some, we, we've been, uh, the companies that we work with, we have been looking at observing their levels of turnover and quantifying it. And we found that the, just the turnover costs themselves tend to be quite expensive at a, at a call center for financial services. We found that the rep turnover was 40%. And these were reps that had to be licensed, so the company had to invest so much in them. And that rep turnover cost the company 45% of payroll. And another restaurant chain we work with, 120% hourly turnover, and 40% for managers. And the direct costs were 25% of payroll. So, so the, just the direct cost of turnover can be huge. Of course, that's a function of how you design the work. The more empowerment you give employees, the more responsibility they have, the higher the turnover costs. So, so, so that's, a, that's, a, that's a lever that, that you have. But, but turnover itself is expensive. And when you operate with high turnover, there are so many things you can't do. So first of all, it's very hard if you have high turnover to have good managers. Because what managers are doing in these environments is they're constantly firefighting. These data came from a specialty retailer we worked with a couple of years ago. And what I show here is three weeks of data. And what, what, what I have on the left on, on the y-axis is for a worker, whether that worker worked more hours than scheduled or fewer hours than scheduled. In an ideal world, we would have everybody working their scheduled hours. But what you, and each dot here represents a worker. So you see here how for workers, like they either work fewer hours or more hours. Nobody works their scheduled hours. Maybe somebody called, off in the, called out in the last minute. They came late. So there's so much instability in people when you operate with high turnover. And then you have all these operational problems. You have phantom stockhouse. You have data accuracy problems. You have uh, customer problems. And what are managers doing in these environments? They're constantly fighting fires. They're not leading, they're not developing people. So when you operate with high turnover, in fact, you commit to some of the things that you can't do. And this is almost like managerial malpractice, I think, because what, what can't you do? You can't hire the right people. You just don't have time. You can't onboard and train well. Again, you don't have time, you're constantly fighting fires. The other thing is, if you, if you haven't hired the right people, if you can't train them so well, and people have, in general, low ability because they don't know what to, what to do, then you lose trust in them. And of course, you can't empower them, right? So, so, and then, of course, when you can't empower them, you lose trust in them, you make centralize all the decisions, and some of your decisions will be bad, and then the employees don't trust you, so there's that vicious trust loop that happens. And then when companies operate with high turnover, the other thing that they can't do is they can't manage capacity well. It's so hard to manage labor supply with the demand for labor because people are changing all the time and then of course the work is changing all the time and hard to have good managers and it's really difficult to have a system of continuous improvement. I mean why bother asking employees who are doing the job every day who know most about the job for their input when they're changing all the time. Right? You don't have time for that and this is, this is what I want to come to because there's a misperception that, about what operational excellence is, right? When, when, when you say to an operations person, uh, professor who has been studying this field for many years, like what, what company comes to mind when you say operational excellence, we will always say Toyota because, you know, Toyota production system has been around for a long time and it has shown to create great value, increase, increase uh, quality, lower costs at the same time, and the heart of pro Toyota production system is the ability to improve. That's their competitive advantage. Right? And lean, I mean, you ask every company, they're trying to do lean. Lean comes from Toyota production system. So, but, but somehow we have this conception that endless pursuit of efficiency is operational excellence. So endless pursuit of efficiency, if it creates those high turnover, et cetera, environments, that is the opposite of lean. When you look at Toyota production system, they had this house, and that house has a base. It has a foundation. And in that foundation, there's one thing. There are four things. There's one thing that's called stability. And there are four aspects of stability. One of that is people stability. Toyota production system does not work 
if you have high turnover and low ability. Um, so, so, so this is this is this is what happens. And then, of course, in this system, what ends up happening is you end up creating an inhumane working system, even if you didn't intend it that way. Again, I have never met a leader or a manager who would like to create a humane system, but that's what ends up happening because when you operate this way, you want to control the employees. You put in so many controls and every task is monitored and they feel like they have no empowerment. They feel like what this worker told me. And she is one of the hundreds of people that I interviewed. We are throwaways who are a dime a dozen, just human robots really. And at MIT, what we will say is, if you're designing the job for a human robot, make the robot do the job versus the human do the job. So, so what are the costs of this system? I hope you, you get a sense of how bad jobs are not just bad for, for, for workers, but also creates this vicious cycle and all these can't do's for organizations. There are financial costs, there are competitive costs, there are moral costs, but I think the biggest is the, from an organization standpoint, the competitive cost because I saw this at borders. They couldn't differentiate themselves when they were operating in that vicious cycle. They couldn't provide a compelling reason for their customers to come to their stores and because they couldn't provide great service. And they couldn't adapt to changes because if you don't have that execution muscle, no technology is going to help you, you know, just solve all your problems. We love putting technology, uh, throwing technology at problems, but no technology is, we've seen this in the manufacturing industry before, right? I mean, in the manufacturing, when the Japanese German manufacturing was doing so much better, we said, okay, let's automate and the world will be a better place. And we saw that automation was not the answer. Automation is an enabler, but it's not the answer. So, 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 so the biggest things tend to be competitive, and there are some companies that operate very differently. And I'll give you uh, a couple examples of these companies operating differently, and I'll show you the system that they have in place. And then I will show you that it is possible. It might be overwhelming when somebody, someone sees that system. But, but it is possible uh, to get there. So, so I observed this um, more than 10 years ago. The first company, so, so, so until um, 10 years ago, I was focused in retail in the United States and, and working with a lot of companies that have been, that have been stuck in that vicious cycle. And then I, I was working with Zara. I was <laughs> as a supply chain person. I was you know, trying to figure out what they do in their supply chains. And when I was at Zara, um, they told me about this company that they look up to, and it was called Mercadona. And I said, what is Mercadona? And they said, it's a low-cost retailer, and I like, Look up, Zara looks up to like people here look up to low cost retailer Mercadona and, and then I studied Mercadona and I was fascinated by them because it was closest to what I had seen about Toyota production system in a service environment. So I went back to Spain and, and spent a lot of time with Mercadona and I studied them. And Mercadona, you know, a typical retailer in the United States could have 60 to 120 percent employee turnover. Mercadona's employee turnover was 4 percent. And, and, and first I thought maybe the Spanish people don't know how to calculate turnover. Uh, but then after Mercadona, I studied Quick Trip, a convenience store chain with gas stations based in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Again, 13% employee turnover for their full-timers. If you're a full-timer there, you can make $40,000 in your first year. And then there's Costco and then there's Trader Joe's. So I started seeing these companies that on the one hand offer higher wages, better working conditions, more investment in their people, and they offer the lowest prices to their customers and they're outliers in their industry in terms of how they perform. I mean, if you look at Costco stock performance or their um, companion sales growth or profit growth, you will be amazed at how well they have done since they went public in 1985. So these companies don't just win with their customers and employees, they also win with their, with, with, with their investors and the question was how do they do that? So, so what they do is on the one hand, they invest so much in their people, but on the other hand, they make a set of operational choices that increase the contribution and productivity of their employees. And that's the system that they, they create. And I call this a good job system. And that good job system has four different components in terms of operational choices, and I'll go through them really quickly. They're each a chapter in my first book. I'm working on my second book right now. But, but the first one is that they are obsessed with creating value for the customer. 
I mean, they're obsessed with creating value to the customer. Nothing that doesn't add value, anything that doesn't add value to the customer is not done at these companies. But, they're, but they know that creating value to the customer or being customer first doesn't mean giving all the customers everything that they want. So they're very clear about what they offer their customers and what they don't offer their customers. In fact, there is sometimes a longer list of what they don't offer their customers in order to be the best at what it is that they offer. Um, so if you go to Costco, you know, you're going to get high quality merchandise at low prices and some treasure hunt. There's not going to be a nice shopping environment. It's not going to be convenient. They're not going to have great hours. They're closed on Labor Day. Like there are lots of things that it, it just won't um, provide you. So, so that's the customer focus. And then they simplify, 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 simplify operationally. Simplify so that their employees can be knowledgeable about the products and services that they offer. Simplify so that their employees can be more productive in, in doing their work. Simplify so that their employees can create more value to the customer, contribute more, and as a result, the companies can pay them more. So if you go to Costco, you're going to see a lot fewer products than you go to another retail store. Um, that enables that kind of familiarity, productivity, and being able to help the customer. So that's the first choice. The other one is what I call the killer combination of that uh, task design, which is, on the one hand, they standardize so many things. They standardize processes. They standardize management practices. At Mercadona, if you talk to a store manager, they'll all tell you the, what they do in a day, and it's all standardized. Um, but standardization, even the work processes, HR processes, standardization is not done to control people. Standardization is done to empower people. We all have limited cognitive ability, right? We can't make too many decisions. So why don't I take out all those routine things that are done all the time and standardize? And by the way, we're going to involve people in creating those standards like Toyota does. Um, and then you can take care of the customer. You can order merchandise. You can, you, 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 you can uh, solve customers' problems. You can, you can accept the return at up to $10 or some amount without asking your supervisor for help. And that empowerment combined with standardization is what creates higher sales and lower costs at the same time and, again, enables their employees to contribute more. The third choice that they make is that they cross-train their workers to perform multiple tasks. They don't cross-train everyone to do everything, but cross-train enough so that they have flexibility to deal with customer demand, and cross-train appropriately so that you, you still have some specialization, but also cross-train so that you can solve customer problems. So, so that's the third aspect of these companies. And then the final one is my favorite operational choice, which is that these companies operate with Slack which means they staff their environments with more hours of labor than the expected workload. They have more people than the expected workload. How could this be good for lowering costs? Right? Because then their employees don't make errors. They don't create data problems. They don't create phantom stockouts. They are able to serve the customer better, and customer is, is first in their, in, in their hierarchy. Operating with Slack enables them to do continuous improvement. Who has time for continuous improvement if, you, if, if, if you're always understaffed? Operating with Slack enables them to hire better, because now they're, they can be rigorous. They're not just looking for the next body, because they need so many workers, because nobody wants to be here. So, so operating with Slack enables them to do so many things, but of course, you can't operate with Slack if you have Slackers, right? So, so on the, uh, the operate with Slack also requires them to have, first of all, very good processes, very, very low variability in workload, so that they know how much workload they'll have at any time, so they don't need so, so much Slack. And it also requires high expectations of their employees, and they do have high expectations. I mean, if you see these workers, they will be working super hard, and, and they know what they're doing, and they're there to play every single day. So this is the system that these companies have, and at the heart of it is investment in people and with operational choices, and it is a system that works very nicely together. And then the outcome of the system is you win financially, you win competitively, and for so many leaders, you win morally. I mean, no one, again, likes to do, you know, likes to create bad jobs. So these companies, these leaders who run these companies are extremely proud of being able to do the right thing and, and providing jobs with dignity and respect. So, so you, you may be asking, if my company does not have this good job system in place, if I don't have those four operational choices, if I don't have a high, 
investment in people, if I'm operating with high employee turnover, can I even get there? And my answer to you is yes. Because I have observed during the last couple of years, large companies, small companies, public companies, private companies pursuing this. And the biggest reason for them to pursue this, some of them, especially for, for, for private companies, sometimes the reason could be moral. Some leaders say, we can't live up to our values if we have 90% of our workforce um, getting poverty level wages, right? Some, some companies, com some leaders like Aetna's Mark Bartoloni, PayPal's Dan Schulman, they've come at it, at it from a moral angle. But in the retail world and in other services world, especially with public companies, what I have seen is the biggest reason to do this is competitive. If you wanna create that omni-channel experience in retail, you have to have accurate data. You have to know where the products are. You have to be able to respond to your customers, create that frictionless experience. For that, you need to have good processes, good technologies, and good people, right? So for Sam's Club, the reason to pursue this was because they said, okay, we want to create that frictionless experience for our customers. And to be able to do that, we had to do three things. Product, digital, people. So they put this in the umbrella of winning competitively. And I mean, this is one of the companies that, that we are um, quite happy about. Uh, when, we, when I first met Sam Scott, they said, we have aspirations to raise wages five, six, seven dollars an hour. And I thought, wow, good luck. Um, and they did. Right? They raised wages for, and they started with certain departments, but for thousands of people, they raised wages from a base of $15 an hour to up to $22 an hour. A meat cutter that was making $15 an hour is now making $22 an hour, $7 wage increase. And they did this because the CEO, John Turner at the time, he saw the systemic nature of the good job strategy and he didn't just increase wages, he also simplified. He also standardized, he also focused on the customer. They also did cross training, so they started doing other things too. So I've seen this work at Sam's Club, Walmart is on this journey. The CEO of Sam's Club is now the CEO of um, Walmart USA. They are on this journey. Many years ago, when I would give Mercadona as an example of a company that has 85% full-time employees, people would say, there is no way that you could do that in the United States. Well, Walmart is in its path. Um, by the end of this year, they're going to have two-thirds of their workforce full-time. So it is possible. It can be done. And it's not just these large companies. One of my favorite examples is, well, Quest Diagnostics did this in their call centers. Um, again, they implemented a good job strategy in their call centers. And one of my favorite examples is Mudbay, a small retailer in Northwest that did this. But the biggest reason, again, tend to be on the competitive side. And here are some of the results at Quest Diagnostics in their call centers, you know, what happened to their, within 18 months of implementation, what happened to their financial performance, what happened to them competitively, and, and, and how their leaders felt um, morally. Their employee turnover dropped 53% from 34% to 16%. Unplanned absenteeism was cut in third. Um, they ended up, after wage increases, after investment in people, they ended up having $2 million in savings, 1.2 million of which came from their frontline workers, because now they came up with ideas to all these things. So, but what was really important was that they started winning with their customers. They had no more lost accounts. Their customers were not yelling to them on the phone. And they, they had huge improvements in, in their ability to react to their customers. So, so the reason to do this, though, is, and, and, and I think a prerequisite to doing this, is that you really have to believe in it. You have to believe that the bad job system that I talked about in the beginning is worse than the good job system. And not everybody believes this. And so, so for, for Walmart's Greg Foran, um, six, seven years ago, he fundamentally believed this. And he said, I, I've seen this before. You can't create, if you're not taking care of customers, if you're not taking care of associates, you know what's going to happen with your shareholders. You're not going to win with them. And he said, so the first reason to do this is because you've got to believe in it. And then the second is there's absolutely a financial aspect and you want to win. And, and the other prerequisite of this is, and I think this is the biggest barrier to be able to do this. The other prerequisite is belief in workers. So John Ferner, who was the CEO of um, Sam's Club, who is now CEO of Walmart USA, when he talks about this, he, he says, you know, I asked him once in front of a large audience, I said, 
What gave you the conviction to make such big bets, such huge increases in, in wages? And he said, I had such belief in, it, in the team that was in the field, people that work in our fulfillment centers, they cut meat, they bake bread, they run registers up front. They had so much belief in the enthusiasm. I had so much belief in the enthusiasm they had. If we could take a bet on them, that they would do everything they could to make it worth for us. And this belief in people is such a huge prerequisite because I have also met other leaders who would say, you know, most people are not worthy of $15 an hour. And, 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 and the thing is, or, 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 or the assumption will be that, and, and, uh, and, and McGregor from MIT has this theory, X and theory Y, which is, you know, leaders have belief about workers, right? Some leaders, um, he calls them theory X managers, Theory X managers think that workers are lazy, they don't want to take on more responsibility, we really need to control everything that they do. That's the Theory X managers. And then there's Theory Y managers who think that most people want to do a good job if you're given the right conditions. Most people want to take responsibility, they want to create value. The thing is, whatever your assumption about people is, you're right. Because the system, in the bad job system, that system that you generate, you end up seeing workers who don't care, who have attendance problems, and whose minds are not on the job. And that reinforces your assumption that human beings are lazy. Let's have smart managers with the lazy frontline workers, right? And then, if you have the assumption that people are capable, then you design a whole different system, and again, you're proven right, because now, People are behaving differently. In Quest Diagnostics, it was amazing because a few of their employees didn't make it when they moved from the other system to the good job system, but most of their employees thrived in the new system. And, and the reaction from some leaders was, I didn't know that they had it in them. And they found that, you know what, they had it in them if you offered them the opportunities. Not 100% of them, but most of them. Because when we have this assumption, then we, the assumption that most workers are lazy, we end up creating an environment assuming the lowest common denominator, and then all the other people, you know, we waste all the human talent, human knowledge, human capability. So, so, so I hope you get a glimpse of the bad jobs and good job system. I, have you, I hope you have some conviction that the good job system is superior to the alternative, and, and that maybe learning about some of these uh, companies that are moving might give you the courage um, to, to do that. And I'll leave, and I, and I realize I'm uh, over time, but I'm gonna leave with this woman, Patty Donovan is her name. She works at Quick Trip, which is a convenience store chain with gas stations that makes 89% higher profits than the top quartile in their industry. Extremely profitable business. And when I met Patty and so many other people, they just loved being there. And, and I said, why? You know, the job is, you clean the cash, you, you, you check out people at the cash register, you clean bathrooms, you clean gas pumps, like it's not a glamorous job. And she said, every day I get to work 12 or 14 people, and they go out and they touch 12 to 14 people, so I get to make a really big impact on so many people's lives by getting to see them that they're here to make a difference. So if we can create good jobs like that with meaning and dignity in a place like a convenience store chain with gas stations, we should be do that everywhere. And at a time where we have so much injustice in this country and so many other places in the world, at a time where we realize essential workers are really essential to the functioning of our economy, I can't think of a better time to pursue good jobs and, and, and create organizations with good jobs. So thank you, and I will take questions now. How do we change the narrative that low wage, and <laughs> the, the difference between the last time I presented in person and this time is that I have trouble reading without my reading glasses, but how do we create, uh, change the narrative that low wage workers aren't lazy, they're physically and mentally unable to return to these jobs? Um, yeah, so as I think about leaders, who have a different idea of frontline workers. I think about John Ferner, Dakona Smith at Walmart, I think about Jim Sinegal at Costco, and one of the things about them is that they started working in the front lines. So they started working in the front lines, and these companies all promote from within, so they know what the work is, 
and they know who the workers are and what their capabilities are. So in your organizations, if there are opportunities to promote leaders who have that frontline experience, that's one way to change that narrative. The other way to change that narrative is to spend a lot of time in the front line. So I just started teaching my MBA class, and, and I tell my students, take a frontline job. Take a frontline service job as a part-time job because taking that job will help you see all the lost opportunities. I had one student who worked, I, I won't name the retailer, a, a huge retailer, and she tracked her hours. And she said, 23% of my time was wasted. And, and nobody asked for my idea. So she was blown. She's like, how can this company operate this way? So taking those jobs, and then you see the workers around you and what their capabilities are. That enables to do it. And then the other one is to read. I mean, some of these leaders who made the changes were avid readers. They read about, you know, read about what happened to uh, Numi workers. Right? When, what happened when the GM factory that closed, Toyota started operating it, and to the same workers, how those lazy workers became the best factory workers in the, in the United States. So, so I think getting that frontline experience, spending time in the front lines, and reading about these transformations is, is, is perhaps um, one way. I wish there was a like, more clear answer, but th th that's the best that I can uh, come up with. I'm not convinced Amazon is motivated to offer good jobs, given reports of bad working conditions and pay. Okay. So, yeah, so, so, so I'm not, um, this is not really a question, um, but, <laughs> So, so I'm not quite sure what to say, but, but oftentimes when I think about Amazon fulfillment centers, the first company that comes to my mind is Ford's factories from 1914, right? Because Henry Ford, he was brilliant, like, like Jeff Bezos is brilliant, right? Before Ford, a typical American could not afford to buy a car. And with Ford, all the efficiencies that they put in place, a typical American could buy a car, and that scale enabled Ford to be the leader for decades until Toyota came, right? And then Toyota showed us that inhumane conditions, high turnover, that's not the best way to make cars. In fact, if you invest in our people, and if you invest in our processes, and if we use the power of people to improve all the time, we can increase our quality and lower our cost all the time. So, so I see this, these parallels. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen to Amazon, but that's the first company that comes to my mind. So I, um, it wasn't a question, and it wasn't really an answer, so let's move on to the next one. How do you explain the challenges with living wages while CEO compensation continues on the rise? I mean, this is, this is, um, this is a society problem, right, that we, I think we have to solve because oftentimes we will be, we will be fine with market wages under cert, for certain people and not for other people. So I think uh, this country in general has a tendency to underappreciate the work of the front lines. And it's, not a, um, and it's not a coincidence, right? When you look at, we just wrote a note called um, unskilled jobs, and we want to understand why are some jobs called unskilled. And when you trace the history, you see that calling some jobs unskilled has a lot to do with class. It has a lot to do with who performs these jobs. Because historically, what we called unskilled were you know, factory, agriculture, service. And when you looked at who the workers construction, initially, you, when you looked at who the workers were, they were either immigrants, people of color, women, and children too, initially. And there was a saying like, we can't call a job a high skill job if a woman is performing it. So I think we have some deep questions to ask about how we value frontline jobs. And, and, and I hope we can elevate those. And then some other people can figure out what to do with CEO compensation. Because it is, it is ridiculous to have more than 300 times the, um, the frontline workers. How does one create a good job system in a constantly changing business? Costco business did not seem to have changed in the past few years. Oh my God, retail has changed so much in the last 10, I mean, it, 
one thing is, I think, if you look at retail, if you look at the number of companies that went bankrupt and that are coming in, it's a very, very live industry. Um, but, but, but constantly changing business. So I can tell you right now, we're working with a, supermarket, with a uh, restaurant chain. And, and, and I hope this will get to the, to, to the answer. And this restaurant chain was so hit by COVID. They had to, um, so many people quit, lots of managers quit, lots of people at the headquarters quit, some were fired. And now, not that business is changing, but there's so much instability in the organization, instability in the environment. How, what do you do? Um, and, and, and our advice to companies oftentimes is, first, Understand how you create value for the customer because that's the most important thing in the good job strategy to, to figure out your customer focus and then stabilize people and stabilize operations as much as you can. So that's one place to start. Um, but if there are, yeah, so I'll stop there. Okay. Taxpayers effectively subsidize bad jobs. How do you make the economic argument that bad jobs companies do not deserve subsidy? Has COVID changed the equation? I mean, COVID um, changed the equ equation in the sense that for the first time that I can think of, workers seem to have a little bit more power. I don't know how long that will last, um, but you must have seen all the wage raises. Uh, some companies are offering a $1,000 signing bonus for the workers because they can't attract workers. So COVID changed the situation in that way on the labor market. I don't know how long, how long the impact will be. But I think as we think about creating more good jobs, it can't be just up to the companies. It also has to be up to our government. It has to be up to our management education. We also, in the MBA field, we tend not to be systems teachers. We tend to sit, teach in silos. And we have to teach our students how to run a good business decently, right? And how to, how, how to create that system. On the government side, you know, higher minimum wages, um, more stable, you know, legislation, about stability in, 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 in hours, in a way that works for companies and workers too, because you have to do these in, in, in conjunction with companies. Or when you make technology investments, you get tax subsidies. When you make worker investments, you don't get any tax benefits. So there are so many opportunities for the government to, to help. And, and as a society, I think you know, at some point, you know, smoking was okay or child labor was okay. And now those things are not okay socially. And perhaps we create more of those social pressures so that offering bad jobs with poverty level wages is not okay. I'm not gonna buy from this company, especially when I can buy the same thing at the same price from a competitor. So customers can play a role too. So I think it's not a simple problem, government, MBA education, you know, business education, um, uh, thinkers, labor, leaders, they all have to be part of the equation. So thank you very much. I will leave this. Professor Ton, uh, thank you so much for the, I love the energy. Especially for being the last talk, super energetic, and the discussion about your, your comment you just made I personally, a few weeks back, I switched from Costco's uh, main competitor, maybe, to Costco, basically for what you said, because the way they treat their employees, not only their customers, but the especially their employees. That was basically the reason I switched to, to Costco, just an example. Thank That's you. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you. I will, Jim Sinegal is coming to my class in two weeks, along with my favorite butcher from Costco and a couple of warehouse managers, so I'm going to tell them that they have oh, a new Please do it. Please member. do it. Thank you. Thank you.